mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout and shout. will overspread the sky, but when traveling days are over, All right, church family, it is time for us to go ahead and begin our Wednesday night services. Love that uh, wonderful fellowship that's taking place. Of course, we've got a few folks that are gone. This is the start of the first uh, week of camp, so we'll keep them in our, in our thoughts and, and prayers with all that's going on down uh, there in, in Kingman. Um, but uh, let's do a few announcements as we get started here tonight. We do have a, a sad one we need to announce as we begin. Michael Hoyt, his father, Daryl, passed away. And so uh, Daryl had uh, some ongoing health problems, but had a stroke, and, and they thought things had settled down, but he kind of unexpectedly passed. So let's definitely be keeping Michael and, and uh, Priscilla and the rest of their family in our prayers. Uh, Jerry Reed had a surgical procedure that was done today, and uh, Lori texted me and said that, that that went well, and there was no sign of cancer, so we praise God for that. I did already mention that uh, Steve and, and Dave, I, I, Matt, why did I put your name on here? Matt's here with us tonight, so, but how's camp been going? Going great. Going, all right, they're having an awesome week of camp down there. I get to go uh, tomorrow and hang out for a few days. Here was some uh, praise and celebration. If you happen to be with us on Sunday, Lily Smith was uh, baptized into Christ, and that was a wonderful, wonderful occasion. Uh, of course, she is the granddaughter of Sue Hill. Uh, her mom's uh, uh, Stacy, uh, uh, Stacy, uh, uh, no, Amby, yeah, Hill Smith. All right, getting it all lined up here. And Stacy, of course, that's uh, the aunt there. Um, was told just before class, Karen Eukins was in the hospital. Is that right, Barb? For about three days there. Karen sits usually right over here. Um, she did not have a stroke, but her legs aren't working quite right. So definitely want to be thinking of our sister Karen. Uh, announcement on a come and go baby shower for Christian Smucker. That's this Sunday, July 18th from 1 to 2.30. They're registered at Walmart, Target, and Amazon. Or you can go to MyRegistry.com, see all the three together to donate towards a gift. See Hillary Carden, Diane Farney, Kim Gustafson, Laura Lee Rollins, or Melody Runyon. All right, are there any other announcements that didn't make it to this list that we need to share with our church family here tonight that I missed out on? What's that? Galen's brother. Yeah, where's Galen at? I saw him run around. Hey, Galen. You're sitting on the wrong side here tonight. Wow. All right. Give us an update on your brother. Well, uh, Alton. Okay. All right. 
So Galen said that he's healing pretty well, but still having obviously some soreness. And I think you shared with us last week, it's going to be a slow process with, with the healing and recovery and all. But uh, appreciate you asking about him, sister. All right, let's go ahead and introduce our speaker here tonight. We are blessed to have uh, Steve Carden, and I asked Steve to put up a little uh, bio, and here's what he said. He said, Steve, with his wife Nancy, currently attend the College Hill Church of Christ in Mulvane, where they have attended for about 40 years. While there, he's preached from time to time, almost always has taught a Bible class. He loves the challenge of teaching a lesson like the one tonight because it just really makes me think outside the box and causes me to question some of the things I've always just accepted as that's just the way it is. Uh, his greatest accomplishment must be shared with Nancy, and that is having three children, all faithful in the church, and watching them raise their children to serve the Lord. Now, many of you may not know that Steve Carden, have you ever heard that last name Carden before? Steve is Matt, our very own Matt Carden's father. And so we are blessed to have Steve with you. Uh, Steve, your wife, uh, is it Nancy? is with us and is it barbara or barb okay grandmother is here with us uh, as well so steve we are blessed to have you come our way and we're excited to hear what you have to say in here in just a minute i'm going to go ahead and say a prayer brother bill you have one or two songs for us tonight all right bill's going to lead us in a couple songs after that steve just kind of hop on up here okay if you'd join me in prayer i'd appreciate it Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this midweek service. It, it's just such a, an encouraging time of our week to be able to gather with our, our brothers and sisters and uh, our, our dear friends in Christ and just to be able to fellowship with one another, to be challenged by the, the wonderful speakers that you, you brought our way to help us understand uh, better or to be reminded of the truth uh, from your word and especially this wonderful topic on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, are, we are so thankful that Steve is able to be here with the, his family and just ask for your hand to be upon him and help him to have a, uh, a ready recollection of the things that he studied and help him to feel loved and appreciated for coming to Eastwood with his family here this evening. Father, we do want to uh, pray for those that we have mentioned. We give you thanks on the behalf of uh, Brother uh, Jerry uh, and his uh, successful surgery uh, here today. Uh, we are praying for our, our brother Michael that lost his, his father unexpectedly and just ask that you would wrap your loving arms around him and the rest of their family. Uh, we are asking for your blessing upon all our counselors and directors and all the, uh, the campers that are out at Silver Maple this week and in the weeks to come. What an encouraging spiritual time for them to be able to share together, keep them, them safe. We rejoice. Uh, in the baptism that Lily experienced this, uh, this past Sunday and being part of your forever kingdom. Uh, Father, we do want to pray uh, for uh, Galen's brother Alton and his continued uh, recovery going forward and our sister Karen Eukins and some of the physical uh, challenges she's been facing. Uh, Father, thank you again for this opportunity to study, to worship, and to fellowship tonight. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Number 659, if you're going to grab a book, I love to tell the story. I was whining a little bit to Tony over there earlier before class about, I've never led this song before, but I really like it. So I hope that, um, that you all will sing out to, to, um, to help me along because I am leery of it. I love to tell a story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell a story because I know it is true.
dreams than all the golden fancies of all my golden dreams. I love to tell a story. It did so much for me. And that is just a reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory, I sing the new, new song. Twill be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in Thank you for that that needed that help um, this story made me think of uh, last night we were at Bob Johnson's and the groups of us go there on Tuesdays and I had told Perry to lead a prayer Sunday to ask for the return of one of the girls that had ran or I don't know if she ran or got away or whatever but she's back you know it wasn't the type of girl that you would think would run away she's real vulnerable looking but um, but she's back, so so praise the Lord for that. Um, Six hundred and fifty. There's a call come ringing o'er the westless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The gospel light, let it shine forever. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light, and the golden at the cross we lay, send the light, send the light.
send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us pray that grace may everywhere Send the light, send the light, and the Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from the shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The gospel light, let it shine forever. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine Good evening. Man, it is awesome to be here tonight. I'll tell you what, I've talked to Wayne before uh, the class this evening, and, and I told him, Wayne, I have studied harder for this lesson than any lesson I've studied for in a long, long time. Uh, it's nice to see everybody here this evening. Obviously, you didn't read the signboard outside that had my name on it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been here probably, so... I was talking to Matt the other day, and I said, Matt, how much time do I have? He says, oh, Dad, around 30 minutes or so. I said, okay, per page? <laughs> Let's bow for prayer. Holy Father, we are indeed grateful that we have this time that we can be here this evening. We love you, Father, and we love your word. And I pray, Father, that you would help us this evening as we continue a study concerning the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that your Spirit would guide me tonight in the things that I have to say. May I say things that, that are good and true and that are truly from your Word. And I pray, Father, that we may be inspired this evening from this lesson. Father, I'm so grateful for this congregation and for the wonderful things that they do and continue to pray for them, Father, and, and would ask that they would allow your Holy Spirit to guide them in ways that they don't even know about yet. Keep them strong, Father, and keep them safe in your arms. And through Jesus, I pray. Amen. By show of hands, how many people here tonight know who God is, what he is about, what he does for us, and how he works in the church today? Anybody? Show of hands. I need to change this lesson because we don't have many people that know. <laughs> same, same question about Jesus. Who he is, what he does for us, how he works in the church. Any ideas? I got fewer hands up that time than the first time. So here's the real question. What about the Holy Spirit? As a church, as individuals, do we understand what he does, how he works, do we know who he is? Raise your hand. Every time I asked a question, I got about half the responses of the previous question. All right, well, I believe that the Holy Spirit is really not easy for most people to understand. Do I understand him? Absolutely not at least not to the point that I would like to be able to understand him. But have we ever asked ourselves why this is the case? 
my generation, and I believe the generation that's ahead of me, were the don't ask generation. I'm not talking about don't ask, don't tell. I'm just talking about plain old don't ask. Because whenever I would ask a Sunday school teacher, even my mom and dad a few times, questions about the Holy Spirit, you know what kind of answers I'd get? We don't understand him. So we just don't talk about him very much. After all, he's a spirit or he's a ghost. And who can understand things of that nature? I asked a lot of people before this lesson because I wanted to get a little bit of foundation here. I just asked them about the Holy Spirit. Did they understand him? Do they understand how he works in the church or anything like that? Here's just a, a, a small, small sampling of answers that I got. And see if these are familiar to you. It's complicated. Okay? I even had one say, it's like a pet rock. But this comes from a guy who carries a little plastic Jesus around in his pocket too. A big answer that I got, it's a mystery to me. But do we forget the passage in John chapter 4, verse 24, where it says, God is a spirit. And yet, many of us in here had no problem raising our hand. Do we know who God is? Yeah. What is God? He's a spirit. Maybe that didn't help things. Let's look at things a little bit more logically if we could. Would God want you and I to be the dwelling place for somebody who is a total, complete mystery to us? John chapter 14, beginning in verse 25, it says, All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now what if this passage read this way instead? I have spoken these things while I've been with you. But it is nearly time for my departure. My Father will send someone who will fill your lives with confusion. One of whom you know nothing and of whom you cannot know anything. And because of this, there will be no peace. You should be afraid. You should be very afraid. Now, how absurd is that? Does that sound as absurd to you as it does to me? That is not what God wants for his church. That is not what God wants for his children. Now, our topic, the Holy Spirit in the church. We know that the church is made up of what? Individual members, right? All individual members. And therefore, it is impossible, I believe, for us to separate the work that the Holy Spirit does within the person from the work that the Holy Spirit does with the church. But we've already mentioned, we don't often talk about the Holy Spirit at least in a way that he is made real to us, in a way that we know and we understand that he truly is a part of us. Tell me, what do we really know of this gift that we received when we were baptized? Unfortunately, I think for most of us, the answer is very little, very little. 
Does the Holy Spirit seem real to you? Now think about that. I don't have any problem knowing and believing that God is real. I don't have any problem knowing that His Son is real. And I don't have any problem knowing that the Holy Spirit is real but why is that? Because the Bible tells me so and I believe the Bible. But do I understand what he does for me and what he does for the church <coughs> so that we can really see and understand that the Holy Spirit is real? Who is the Holy Spirit? This is another thing that I had to overcome in my life. Because how did we refer to the Spirit? As an it. The Holy Spirit is not an it. And if you've ever thought that way, I want you to just put that back in the back closet and bring out the fact that the Holy Spirit is a he. He is a he. He is the Holy Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? And in Romans 8, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. How many of us belong to Christ? Who has to be inside of each of us? The Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit does. How can, how can we know that the Holy Spirit is working within this congregation here at Eastwood? And I'm not talking about the individual person. I'm talking about how can we know that the Holy Spirit is alive, well, and active within this congregation? Well, let me, let me turn around and ask a different question. Have you ever been to a congregation where the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit was obviously not working? Nancy and I have. About 40 years ago or so, we were, we were on a little trip, and we were at Fort Worth, Texas, and we stopped at one of these huge mega churches. Big people just coming in by the droves. I thought, man, this is going to be good. Was I ever fooled? <coughs> With all the people there, not one person greeted us that morning, not a single soul. Whenever we were going through the worship service, here were all these hundreds of people gathered in there just simply going through the motions. Is that what the Holy Spirit wants out of you and me? Just simply going through the motions? Just to understand what I'm talking about, let's look at what the Bible defines as the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I know this is probably the first time you've heard that in this series. But in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, a lot of you can just quote this, no problem at all. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. If the fruit of the Spirit is so clearly defined, then if He is allowed to work within the congregation, should we not see these things from the congregation? <coughs> the problem we witnessed was that whenever Nancy and I were there that Sunday morning, we couldn't have, have listed a single one of those fruits. Not one. <clears throat> now I'm very sure that as individuals of the congregation, that there was, the Holy Spirit was at work within individuals. 
Because if I had been there longer, I would learn that some people had love and patience and kindness and all these things. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but as a congregation, it just wasn't there. Let me give you another example, maybe a little more common in the church today. A congregation where nothing is happening. No evangelism, no mission work, no real caring about one another, no real effort to help those inside or outside the congregation who are in need, and the list goes on and on and on, doesn't it? If we're not seeing the congregation do these things, is the Holy Spirit working within that congregation? My only conclusion is it can't be. He cannot be working in a congregation that does not allow him to work. In all of this, there is a truth that I've come to know and understand. In 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it says, Do not quench the Spirit. Some versions say, do not extinguish the Spirit. Do we realize what's being said there? Do we realize who is being addressed there? Paul is addressing a congregation of people, and he's telling this body of people, don't quench the Spirit. Why would Paul say that? Because it can be done. As a congregation, we make the decision of whether the Holy Spirit is going to be allowed to work or whether we are going to extinguish him. Let's look at a passage in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a, a sound like a mighty rushing wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That's my illustration for the night. Talk about power. Think about that for just a moment. You know, we, uh, how, how many of you, uh, if you don't mind my asking the question, how many of you have grown up in the church? A lot of us here. And so whenever we grow up in the church, we hear these stories from the time we're way down this small, and, and, and they just become stories. We don't realize the awesome message that is given in some of these stories. And the fact that the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind and there were tongues of fire on these men's head and they could speak languages they had never studied. That is amazing. These men, though, I will submit to you, had to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to do his job. Your congregation, I believe, has been through some lessons on spiritual giftedness. Man, it's a marvelous set of lessons. Hillary told me about this, and I said, man, I've got to teach this in Mulvey. And we did. We taught it, and we had a great time with it. So you should know that each one of you possesses certain spiritual gifts. The question is, is are we allowing God to work through his Holy Spirit in us to make those gifts the most that they can be? And then it goes on past the individual. Are we allowing God through his Holy Spirit to take these gifts that we have and put them together so that really, really good things can happen. 
Now, while certain parts of the scripture are written to individuals, Timothy or Titus, for example, much of the New Testament is written to a congregation, a church somewhere, like the Thessalonians or the Corinthians or the Ephesians or, or that sort of thing. And in the context, the writer is speaking often in terms of the congregation as a whole unless he picks somebody by name and makes an address to that person. As I was looking at this, I couldn't help but think that I found out that one of the big jobs that the Holy Spirit has is to bring unity in the church. Is that a big job? Oh my goodness, yes. Especially in a world today where we're raising our children and we're raising our grandchildren where unity is not a desired quality. Individualism is what it's all about. I'm going to do it my way, you do it yours, that's fine as long as it doesn't mess up my way or whatever, but to be together, uh -uh, I might have to give up something in order to have that. We cannot have unity in the church without the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Oh, oh hold up just a minute. What are we reading here? We're reading the fruit of the Spirit again, aren't we? Just in a different passage, it's the same thing. Then he goes on, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I counted seven ones in there, and that one means unity to me, and seven in just six short verses, actually three verses, that's too many to ignore. Just can't ignore that. But I want to talk to you about something just a little bit different. I want everybody to fasten your seatbelt. But then again, maybe you're way ahead of me. But I was doing the study on this lesson, and I came across another author's words, and, and it really set me back on my heels about what he had to say. I believe that everybody in this auditorium believes that the that the, uh, the church is the body of Christ. And I think we all also believe that this isn't the only place where you'll find the body of Christ. It's in Mulvane. It's in Derby. It's in Canada. It's all over the place. As a matter of fact, whenever we baptize somebody in Mulvane, one thing that we do is we form this great big circle in the congregation. Everybody's holding hands, and somebody will tell the individual that was just baptized that this circle represents the church around the world. Because virtually any place you go, you can find the body of Christ somewhere. But here's what rocked my boat. The body of Christ is around the world, but it does not just include those who are alive today. Let that sink in. We are part of that very same body that Paul is a part of. We are part of of the very same body that the church at Corinth is a part of. And I say in the present sense, why? Because the body of Christ is alive. Now think about that for just a minute. 
And so when the Holy Spirit is working to bring about unity, it's not just within Eastwood. And it's not within Eastwood and Mulvane and Derby or whatever. Man, we're talking about unity with the church that existed almost 2,000 years ago because that church is, not was. Am I making any sense to you? Part of the, the purpose of this lesson tonight is to try to just get you to scratch your heads a little bit. And if I'm getting you to do that, then it's a good thing. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, there is no mystery. And I believe that. Can I tell you everything about the Holy Spirit? Absolutely not. No way. I can't tell you everything about God. I can't tell you everything about His Son. But they are very real to me. And it is no mystery to me as to why they should be real. And the Holy Spirit, same way. Show me one passage in Scripture where Jesus Christ was confused about the Holy Spirit. Show me once where Paul or any of the apostles expressed doubt about his capabilities or his work in the church. It's not there, is it? Because they took on the Holy Spirit just like they would God or Jesus Christ and said, let's move on out here. We now have another person indwelling within us and dwelling in the congregation as a whole that's going to help us accomplish some amazing things. The whole thing is we just have to let him do it. And maybe that's where we really need to fasten our seatbelts because I think, and, and this is me too, I can't point fingers. I've got too many pointing back at me. But if we were to take off the blinders, take off the earmuffs, take off whatever it is, and, and, and just turn it over to the Holy Spirit to work within us, we might be absolutely amazed at what we could do as individuals and even more amazed as what our congregation can do. And what other ways can we, can we see the Holy Spirit working at Eastwood? Well, first let me say I've never seen him. Never gone up to him, shaking his hand, haven't had a conversation, one-on-one -on -one type thing, anything like that. And you know what? Things just don't happen today like they did in the first century. There is no mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire, uh, speaking in tongues and, and that sort of thing. But today... We experience him through our faith. Our faith in the Holy Spirit is so necessary. And in the fruit that he bears in us. The fruit that he bears in me as an individual, the fruit that he bears in my congregation. And the same thing is very true here. You might even say we live in the age of the Holy Spirit. You see, we as individuals and as a congregation just cannot accomplish what we need to accomplish without him. The apostles couldn't. The apostles relied heavily upon the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you a question. Why was Jesus baptized? To fulfill scripture. Any others? Yeah. Have, you know, I have been a Christian for 53 years. And it took getting to teach this lesson for me to understand that whenever Jesus was baptized, it wasn't just to fulfill Scripture. It wasn't just so he could be an example. Brothers and sisters, it was so he could receive the Holy Spirit. When Jesus came into our world, what did he do? Well, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, rather he made himself nothing. He emptied himself completely. 
And so if he's going to go about doing God's work, and he has to have the Holy Spirit, how's he going to get it? He was baptized so that he could have that Holy Spirit. Now let's turn to, let's turn to Luke chapter 3, 21 and 22, where Jesus is baptized. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was being baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Look at your Bibles. Read the Scriptures. It isn't until Jesus is baptized that his work begins in earnestness. Because he didn't have the Holy Spirit. Now, if my Lord and Master needed the Holy Spirit in order to do His work, what does that say about me? I need the Holy Spirit. What does that say about Eastwood as a whole? We need the Holy Spirit. Oh, He is so powerful. And He can make you and I powerful as well. He gives our congregation life. You know, we talk about the spirit that, that is in a person, not the Holy Spirit, but it's kind of what makes that person who they are, causes them to do dirt, certain things, and so on and so forth. He's a very spirited individual, or he's got no spirit about him. Do you understand where I'm coming from on that? Well, the Holy Spirit gives the church its life. The Holy Spirit gives the church its strength and its power, and we see this through unity in the church and through love in the congregation. The Holy Spirit will lead this congregation, and this is one of the best ways, I think, to know that he is at work within a congregation. The church if it is united in its efforts and what it's going to accomplish, there's no holding you back. The Holy Spirit can cause things to happen that you and I haven't even dreamed of yet. As individuals, yeah, we can, we can have and we can display those fruit of the Spirit. But think of how much more can be done when there's a whole bunch of us together united for a cause, united in an effort to do something. There's something that's very powerful there. Things happen when we work together that cannot happen when we're working apart. And members of the congregation can see it and they can feel it because they are united in purpose, in purpose and they're motivated in that purpose. Finally, I think we just need to talk about him more. Things that we don't talk about never seem to reach the realm of true belief like they should. Maybe if I talk about things more, Maybe they become more a part of my life. Maybe they become more real to me. I, I'm wondering if many of the things that we attribute to just God or to just Jesus working in us should be acknowledged as God's Holy Spirit working in us. Why would he give him to us? For example... When we ask God to comfort us in a particular situation, I, in the announcements tonight there are, are several that may be needing comfort. While God will do that, might it be more appropriate perhaps if we were to modify our prayer to, to simply say, you know, uh, that we're praying that God would send His Holy Spirit to comfort us, or that God would work through His Holy Spirit to comfort us. The thing that happens there is whenever we're talking about it, pretty soon He does become real. 
Because up here, we're beginning to make the connection that we need to make, that the Holy Spirit does work. When we see that perhaps we're needing leadership in the congregation for something, <clears throat> should we not ask God to have His Holy Spirit guide and lead those that are in the leadership positions to spur the rest of us on to doing good things? You see where I'm going. If we really want to see the Holy Spirit working in the congregation, it just seems to me that, at least for me, I need to acknowledge Him more. On a recent trip, my mother and I took to Missouri. We stayed with her sister for two or three nights, something like that. And I was absolutely amazed at how easily she was able to talk about her Heavenly Father being a part of her life. And it was never done in any kind of a pious way, but she would just insert him into the, con in the conversation. It's something like, Father really helped us today. Father was watching over us whenever we almost got in that traffic accident. And he's just, he is so real to her because she talks about him in those ways. How real could the Holy Spirit be to us if we talked about him in a similar way? Constantly giving him the praise and credit for things that he does in our lives every day. What would it be like for us if we could be as comfortable talking about and giving the Holy Spirit credit for all He does in our lives. I want to close with, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you, Father, that I have been given this wonderful opportunity to come and speak to these, these tremendous brothers and sisters. Father, I pray that something I may have said tonight would inspire somebody here to just simply scratch their heads and, and, and want to get into your word and, and study it more so that we might all know more of your Holy Spirit. Father, we love you so much, and we praise your name. We thank you for all the blessings that you give to us each day, and it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Um, this is the, the first time we almost had a call to fire marshal to uh, send some firefighters to... Uh, Calm down, uh, one of our speakers. No, Steve, what a blessing to have you with us here tonight, and, and Nancy and Barbara, uh, welcome. Glad that uh, you all could uh, be with us here this evening. It has been good, just like the Lord has uh, blessed us so much uh, with our uh, Wednesday night uh, summer speakers here, and Steve, great job on, uh, on your, your lesson with uh, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Now one thing we've been doing with our speakers is just to let them know how much we appreciate them and their family gets to come to uh, join them as we sing this as a closing song. We love you with the love of the Lord. So uh, East would just sing this together and let them know how much we appreciate and love them. We love you with the love of the Lord. We love you with the love of the Lord. We see And we love you with the love of the Lord. We do, and we love all those that have been watching online as well. We are dismissed at this time. Thank you very much. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed.